welcome to the podcast. My name is Austin Morris, and I am the host for Crimson Anchor Ministries Podcast. I hope all of y'all are doing fine. Today on the podcast, I'm going to be discussing a very passionate topic for me, and that topic is Mormonism. Some of you may be thinking, what is so special about Mormonism? Well, to me, Mormonism is very, very special. Um, it is a group of people that God has placed a very serious burden um, on my heart. A little over a year ago, uh, God placed a calling on my heart to go to Utah. And I never really understood why until earlier, last semester, when God, when God started placing a burden on my heart for Mormons, I began to research Mormonism, began to read the Book of Mormon, and really understand what these people believe and learn how to combat it with scripture. So over the next couple of episodes, we're going to be discussing Mormonism, diving into their beliefs, and looking at how we can combat their beliefs with scripture um, to show them the wrongs of their belief and hopefully point them to the real God and the real Jesus. Um, So in today's episode, we're going to... um, look at Mormonism as a whole, and then like focus in on their salvation, their views on salvation. Uh, we're going to look at if it falls under the umbrella of Christianity. Is it a cult? Uh, we're going to look at that. We're going to look at some of the differences. Um, buckle up, because this is going to be a fun couple of episodes. Um, so first and foremost, we're going to give a, I'm going to give a background of uh, Mormonism. So the head of the Mormon religion is Joseph Smith, for those of y'all who don't know. He was born on December 23rd, 1805. Smith himself said that all the different denominations under Christianity were very disturbing to him. Um, I could definitely see that and why he would jump to that conclusion. He found out they were very disturbing and so he spent a lot of time wondering which one was true. In 1820 he went to pray and was apparently visited by God the Father and Jesus. Um, They both told him not to join any of the churches. Fast forward three years later in 1823 at the age of 17 an angel called Moroni who claimed to be the son of Mormon the leader of a group of people called the Nephites who had lived in the Americas appeared to him. The angel told Joseph Smith to translate the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon was written on gold plates near where Joseph Smith lived These plates weighed about 50 pounds each. In 1827, Smith received the plates, and the same angel instructed him to translate the plates. And then the Book of Mormon was published in 1830. So, what is the Book of Mormon about? It covers a period of about between 600 B.C. and 8400. It talks about a group of people called the Jaredites who moved from the Tower of Babel to Central America, but died due to their own immorality. Then some Jews are brought into the picture that came into Central America to escape persecution. They would soon be separated into two groups, the Nephites and the Lamanites. These two groups would fight. In an all-out war, the Lamanites would win, and they are known today as the American Indians. So in this part of the series, we are going to address several several issues that differ from them being under the umbrella of Christianity. So first we're going to deal with their salvation. So first let me give you my beliefs on salvation. I believe that we are saved by faith through grace that is extended from Christ's sacrifice and work for us on the cross. In Romans chapter 5 verses 1 through 5, It says, Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have also obtained access through Him by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also rejoice in our afflictions because we know that affliction produces endurance. Endurance produces proven character, and proven character produces hope. This hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. It says there simply enough about what salvation looks like for Christianity. I also love Ephesians 2, 1-10, through 10, and how it says that we were once walking in our sins and trespasses. We were enemies of God, 
essentially on a highway to hell. And then God in His grace and mercy extended His hand to us, saving us from our sins. So through two significant passages of Scripture that are not taken out of context, we can see how our salvation is not based off of the works we do. Works are how we bear and show spiritual fruit, but it is not the acid test for our salvation. So here's the first issue that I have uh, with the Book of Mormon and their views on salvation. I'm going to turn to 2 Nephi 25-23. And read the first issue that I have. Two Nephi twenty three says, For we labor diligently to write, to persuade our children and also our brethren to believe in Christ and to be reconciled to God. For we know that it is by grace that we are saved, after all we can do. First off, uh, how much is all we can do? Also, how can one live freely under salvation based on all you can do? That makes no sense. Here's how I take that idea of salvation. If you are a Mormon, and let's say for example, you decide to take your family and go see a movie rather than help the poor or feed the homeless or something like that that's a good work you, you go see a movie or you go to a concert rather than ministering to the lost then really you have not done all you can do and you are condemned to hell based on your own book How does the, the Mormon Church explain this? Well, the 13th president of the Mormon Church, Ezra Taft Benson, says, What is meant by after all we can do? After all we can do includes extending our best effort. It includes living His commandments, referring to God slash Jesus, loving our fellow men, praying for our enemies, clothing the naked, feeding the hungry, visiting the sick, and giving to those who have not. This is a paraphrase of what he said. Uh, they get this from Messiah 4.15 and Matthew 25.34-40. Let's look at Matthew 25.34-40. So the, the context of this is this is the, the, uh, the sheep and the goats. It says, And the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. That's where they have pulled this passage from. So let's continue with this train of thought about living and extending your best effort. But also looking at, in the Book of Mormon, Moroni, chapter 10, verse 32. Yet yeah, come unto Christ to be perfected in Him, and deny yourselves of all ungodliness. And if ye shall deny yourselves of all ungodliness, and love God with all your might, mind, and strength, then is His grace sufficient for you, that by His grace ye may be perfect in Christ. And if by the grace of God ye are perfect in Christ, ye can in no wise deny the power of God. The way this is worded, it sounds like after you deny yourself of all ungodliness, then you are saved by God's grace. That is an impossible level of righteousness to achieve. There is nobody on the face of this earth that I know who has denied themselves of all unrighteousness. You can deny yourself of some unrighteousness, there are some people who can die, deny themselves of most unrighteousness, but the only person to ever deny themselves of all unrighteousness is Jesus. Even the most righteous man on the face of this earth cannot live up to that expectation. Continuing, let's look at Alma 11.37 in the Book of Mormon. And if you're wondering why I am taking time to open the Book of Mormon, it's to show you guys that I'm actually reading from the text itself, and I'm not just making up words to make the religion or worldview seem like it's something it isn't. 
Alma 11.37, I say unto you again that he cannot save them in their sins, for I cannot deny his word. And he hath said that no unclean thing can inherit the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, how can ye be saved except ye inherit the kingdom of heaven? Therefore, ye cannot be saved in your sins. Now, this is where I can somewhat understand where they are coming from, but I don't necessarily agree. In order for God's salvation to work, the way that works, I believe He reaches down to us in the middle of our sin, no matter how deep of a pit we may be in. We cannot make ourselves perfect before Christ saves us. Christ saves us while we are imperfect. We come to Christ as we are, and He meets us where we are. The passage isn't saying that God cannot save them from their sin. It's saying that He cannot save them in their sins. Almost like in order for them to be saved, they have to work together. There is no immediate redemption. It seems to me that the Mormons believe you have to earn God's love. First off, that isn't even remotely close to the true gospel. For example, if you are in a relationship with a young lady or girls, if you're in a relationship with a young man, and you have to earn their love, that's not even remotely close to what true love is. Like, if the only way for you to earn the love of your spouse is to do good things for them, they will only love you if you make dinner for them or do laundry or make really good coffee. That's not the definition of what true love is. True love is unconditional and it is sacrificial. It's not earned. Now, doing good things for your special person is a good way of showing them that you love them. But you shouldn't have to earn that love because that's not love at all. Where is this example shown in the Bible? It's shown in my favorite parable, the parable of the prodigal son. God has recently shown me that through this parable, it denies work-based salvation. For example, for, for those of you who don't know the story, the prodigal son, he begged his father to receive his portion of his riches earlier than he should have. He goes off, blows all his money, and then finds himself destitute, finds himself poor, and finds himself eating with the pigs in order to survive. There's a shift that happens in his heart where he realizes that he had it really good with his father, and he regrets his decision. And so the prodigal son is standing there, and he's, he's kind of replaying in his head like what he's going to say. You know how when you're about to confront somebody about something or you have something that is really pressing that you need to get off your chest, you're sort of replaying it in your head, the things that you're going to say. That's what he's doing. And if you had uh, basically taken your dad's money, made a run for it, and then had to come back, you would be rehearsing what you had to say too. <clears throat> and he says, I'll get up go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired hands. So he's planning what he will say. He's going to say, Father, I have sinned against God. I have sinned against you. I am not worthy to be your son. Make me like one of your hired servants that I can essentially hope to earn some respect and some love back. So he goes to his father and he says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father seems to cut him off. And he's like, get the cloak, get the ring, prepare the barbecue. My son has come back. Notice how like the father cuts his son off and doesn't let him get to the works part of the story that the son was trying to replay in his head, the father cuts him off and says, No, I know where you're going with this. He knew that his son was going to try to come back and earn his favor. And the father was like, Stop, please, you do not need to work to earn my love. So if there's any passage that 
disassembles workspace salvation in my opinion that is the best example right there so in a nutshell that is the view of Mormonism and their view on workspace salvation but thank you guys for tuning in to the podcast it has been great having you I hope you guys have learned a lot and thank you for taking the time uh, to listen to what I have to say and what God has to say have a good one